Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly. The films are The Gentleman, and then we danced, and sixty-three up. David, did you watch any of the Oscars? I, I should say hi, David. How are you? Did you watch any of the Oscars? <laughs> I'm okay, Jill. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I did not, and so uh, why do you ask? Did you, did you watch the Oscars? I watched some of them, and I just really wished I hadn't. So, um, <laughs> I, I I wanted to see if uh, uh, my uh, award partner in crime there was. Um, had 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 stuck his eyeballs to it, and yeah, no, uh, I, I I it it's just uh, more than I really care to take in. Of course, I am sort of always curious about the results, which are very easy to find out. Exactly, so. you can do that just with, with without uh, without getting engaged at all. You can just look it up. Yeah, that is for sure. Also, uh, I understand that the viewership was, you know, really down this year. So, uh, it, it, you know, they've been talking about doing something about the Oscar show for many years. Maybe one of these decades they'll actually do something about it. They could get a but, host. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, I, it's, all it's, of these quibbles and niceties about exactly how the show is presented all seem to me to be less important than the fact that when I used to watch the thing, it just went on forever and forever and forever. And, uh, you know, at, at least this year, it was boring to see Parasite do all this winning. I know that it's it's a great big, like, important thing because the first time that a movie with subtitles, you know, won, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it, the movie has already had such a parade of honors from so many critics and organizations that it's you know it's just another one heaped on top of that uh my only thing that i'm just really grateful for i mean is that it did not turn into a sweep for joker so uh, you know that, that as long as that didn't happen as long as joker didn't end up going home with a whole kit and caboodle of them it was not it was not a worst case scenario <laughs> and that brings us to the gentleman to the gentleman, to this week's films, right. Well, The Gentleman is the latest movie from Guy Ritchie, who is very, very well. He's made different kinds of movies, but he's best known for the genre in which he kind of first established his name, which is the caper movie. Uh, and here we have a caper movie. And like, uh, I guess, a fairly typical bit of Guy Ritchie fare, uh, it is uh, very stylish. That's a word that's being used uh, on this movie quite a lot. Also very violent. Also all full of four-letter words and people doing all sorts of unsavory things. That is what Guy Ritchie more or less specializes in. Mm -hmm. So what we have in The Gentlemen, and by the way, these characters are not especially gentlemen, mm -hmm. is we have uh, an American played by Matthew McConaughey uh, who has been living in England for many, many years and uh, is a, a very, very prosperous uh, a, a drug, a, a drug dealer. He's not just a dealer. Uh, he has made deals uh, with an enormous amount of uh, British aristocracy uh, who have allowed him to build um, marijuana farms, enormous, elaborate, super high-tech marijuana farms uh, uh, underground uh, on their country estates where nobody will suspect that they're there. So that's uh, that's who the, the Matthew McConaughey character is. And uh, now, as in so many cases, uh, caper movies and heist movies and crime movies. Uh, he wants to get out of the business. He wants to retire and stop always having to look over his shoulder. And therefore he wins. In this case, it's not sort of the last one big score thing, but it's rather he wants to sell his business, which is worth an absolute fortune to uh, another American, a billionaire played by Jeremy Strong. And there's also this rival gang of Chinese dope dealers uh, who want to, uh, to get in on this deal somehow and maybe just take over the whole thing. Uh, and also in the story are some uh, some young uh, thugs uh, who raid one of the underground uh, marijuana farms uh, and make a movie of it, which then goes viral on the internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. And the whole story is told in this elaborate sort of flashback structure where another character uh, played by Hugh Grant is 
sort of satirically pitching a screenplay which sets forth all the things which I have just stated uh, and which then sort of becomes the sort of flashback and flash forward structure of the movie. So that probably sounds confusing. It's not all that confusing to watch. It's mildly entertaining to watch. I can't say that I really enjoyed The Gentleman an enormous amount, but for this sort of movie, for this sort of crime caper movie uh, with a whole lot of violence and people shooting at each other and uh, all sorts of different characters running around and getting in each other's faces for that sort of movie uh, it was it was pretty entertaining it's very very fast moving a bit too long uh, and it ha- certainly has just this this really uh, really marvelous cast uh, I mentioned Matthew McConaughey uh, who you know really knows what he's doing as an actor he doesn't get a chance to show all that much of his acting depth in this movie but he, uh, he, you know, he knows what he's doing. Uh, I mentioned Jeremy Strong. Uh, I happen to be watching right now, uh, getting you know fairly long into it. Uh, Succession, uh, the, uh, the 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 TV series, uh, and uh, Jeremy Strong plays a very important character in that. And here he shows a slightly different side of his personality. And he's an interesting actor who I'm getting more interested in as time goes on. Uh, Hugh Grant is in this movie. He's usually fun to watch. He's okay here. Colin Farrell is in here. Michelle Dockery is in here. Eddie Marsan is in a smaller role as a a sort of a sleazy tabloid newspaper publisher. He's fun to watch. So the movie has some good performances, a lot of lively action. And if you like this sort of thing, if you like the sort of super violent crime caper movie, then The Gentleman is probably a pretty good bet. Our next film today, in fact, all three of our films today are very different from one another. And our next one is very, very different. Uh, the movie called And Then We Dance, written and directed by Levin Akin. And this is uh, it's an international co-production, uh, but it's uh, really a movie about the, the country of Georgia. Uh, it takes place in Tbilisi in Georgia, and uh, it deals very, very much, in fact, the whole movie revolves around Georgian dance. So we have here uh, a young fellow named Merab who is a competitive Georgian dancer. And what he does is uh, he I mean, he wants to be a professional dancer. And Georgian dancing, for those not familiar with the genre, uh, it is a very, very high energy form of dancing uh, with uh, an enormously long tradition behind it. And, of course, a tradition which may, in fact, be dying out. The movie sort of suggests that. Some of the characters tell uh, our main character, Merab, uh, there's no future in Georgian dance. You're wasting your time doing all this training, developing all this skill, uh, going through all this enormous amount of labor, and there's really no future in this. So, anyway, he believes there is a future in it. In any case, it's what he does, and he is very conscientious about this. His brother, who is also a Georgian dancer in training and wants to go into that business, their father, by the way, was once a, a, an important Georgian dancer uh, who then uh, kind of, of, of failed to keep up his career and is now just selling stuff in a local bazaar. Uh, but uh, Merab and his brother are both competitive dancers in this field, uh, training in this field, and the brother is irresponsible. So we have our main character, Merab, who is very responsible, and his brother, who is irresponsible and always getting into trouble, and Merab tries to help him out, and this leads to trouble for him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then into all of this comes very early in the movie, another young dancer named Arakli. And uh, he uh, is uh, a very, very skilled dancer. And it looks like he may be able to push Merab sort of off his game a bit uh, and maybe uh, edge him out as one of the leaders of this young group in training. Uh, But he turns out to have a kind of a rebellious uh, streak within him and all kinds of complications ensue from that. Now, what And Then We Danced is moving toward and what eventually it turns into is a gay romance. Uh, it turns out that Irakli is gay uh, or actually bisexual and that Merab, whose sexuality appears to be sort of unformed, is also moving in the direction of bisexuality and this turns into a, a real love affair fairly late in the movie. So that's a bit of a spoiler, but people ought to know that is really what this movie is ultimately moving toward. So on one level, we have the story of young people training in an enormously demanding field, which may in fact not have a future. (laughs) And on another level, the movie is kind of a love story, kind of a romance about these young people. And, you know, the whole thing is basically a a coming of age story because both the dance training and the, the sort of love affair that develops are both parts of coming of age for our main character, Merab. So how is And Then We Danced as a movie? It's a very likable 
likable, engaging movie, which is telling a story that we have heard a jillion times before. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the love affair were not basically a gay one, uh, it would be exactly like a trillion movies we've seen. So the fact that it's sort of overtly gay love stories are a fairly recent phenomenon in popular culture. We've only seen this story told a half a trillion times before. Uh, so it's not a movie that packs any surprises at all. But it has a very likable lead performance. In fact, all the performances are very likable. Uh, there's very attractive and appealing people in the cast, male and female. And the dancing is terrific. I wish there were more of it. There's really not enough of it. Uh, but, you know, movie's got a lot of energy, a lot of likable young people in it, uh, and enjoyable film and I'm very happy to see a movie which is basically a Georgian production on American screens. Who knows? Maybe it'll win an Academy Award next year. And now for our final film, 63 Up, which is our documentary for today. And I would imagine that quite a lot of people are familiar with what's generally called the Up series. But it started way, way back in 1964 when a short film was made uh, profiling a group of 14 young British children. Uh, they were all seven years old, and the movie was called Seven Up. And it was just a nice little short about some kids in Britain, and the premise was give us a child until he is seven and we will show you the, the, the man or woman who will eventually develop out of this child. That was kind of the premise of it. Well, interestingly, that little short movie from way back in 1964 has turned into a series which is going on to this day. Uh, that first film was made by a Canadian filmmaker named Paul Amon, but then uh, a young filmmaker named, named Michael Apted, an important filmmaker who makes fiction films as well as documentaries, took over the series. And Michael Apted has been directing the series ever since every seven years the filmmakers return to the same group of the original children the original 14 children and looks at what's going on in their lives now so we've had a movie about the kids when they were 14 and when they were 21 and when they were 28 etc and we are now up to when they are 63 years old and that is what 63 up is about now over the years of course changes have taken place some of the children grew up and died uh, other ones decided not to participate in the series anymore although most of them did uh, they generally tend to say that they don't enjoy it very much, but they could keep participating in it. Uh, but now they're 63. Uh, their thoughts are turning to, <laughs> to, to thoughts of old age. Uh, and again, some of them have died and some of them really don't want to really be involved with the series anymore. One thing that was happening to this series along the way is that the filmmakers were so anxious to make each new documentary every seven years be a standalone product that they would include enormous amounts of flashbacks to earlier installments. And the movies really tended to get very long and unwieldy. Uh, they've managed to, uh, to get that impulse somewhat under control now. 63 Up is well over two hours long, but it's not super long. And the, you know, most of the flashbacks that it has, it certainly has quite a number of them, but they're entertaining and they're well chosen. And since some of the flashbacks tend to be the same from one installment to another, uh, it's sort of fun to revisit them and to sort of get your memory refreshed. Anyway, how is it as a movie to watch? If you've been following the Up series, of course, you want to keep up with the latest installment and see what these people have turned out, you know, how they are now in their lives. Some of them are retired. Some of them are thinking very actively of retiring. Some of them are sick. Uh, you know, and again, as I keep saying, some of them have died and we just sort of find out about them. One of those people, I won't reveal which one, uh, there's a sort of a little tribute to that person within the film, even though she died a few years ago, but since the last installment. Uh, so again, that's sort of where we're at. If you have not been following the Up series and you're just kind of curious about this, I really do think that 63 Up would stand pretty well uh, as a standalone movie. Again, it's got plenty of flashbacks in it. Uh, you get to see what these kids looked like, what these kids, what these people looked like uh, in many, many earlier stages of their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the movie would be gibberish if you've never seen a, a part of the Up series before. Um, it's a very entertaining movie. Uh, uh, it's got a lot of wit to it, but now I think maybe more than in any previous installment, uh, 63 Up has a fair amount of, of, of kind of somberness to it, because even
even the people who are doing very well and who have had good active lives and have thriving families and all of that are starting to think about the end of life starting to uh, to approach, or at least the, let's say the, the the last stages of life. Uh, and as we see these flashbacks to when these people were little kids or when they were adolescents or when they were young adults, and now we see them as they're kind of old adults, uh, it's sobering in, in, in its way. Now, I'm quite a lot older than 63 myself, so I guess I'm sobered anyway. Uh, I had a good time watching these these young folks who are about a dozen years than I am. Uh, and uh, I think that it's just marvelous that the series keeps going on, and I'm just hoping that everybody, including the, uh, the filmmaker Michael Apted, continues to live and thrive and be healthy so that seven years from now we can get 70 up. That, I think, would be a real accomplishment. So that is my pretty darn diversified story this week, Jill. And you know how we feel about diversity and diversification. <laughs> David Sterrett films in focus the films The Gentleman, and then we danced, and 63 Up. Up. <laughs>